All right, so um, today we're going to be talking about granular filtration, and the notes are posted on Blackboard. Um, just as an announcement, remember that um, Monday's class won't be live in this room. It'll be a recorded lecture that I'll post and email you the link and the details for that. Um, I also have aim to have the next homework assignment um, to be distributed for Monday's class. Um, so that'll include some practice with settling granular filtration and membrane filtration. Um, any announcement questions? All right. Well, let's talk about granular filtration then. Remember that in the water treatment process, what we've talked about so far is that in the raw water, there'd be the suspended colloid particles, which are negatively charged and therefore repulsive to each other and uh, they're not going to settle out just under the force of gravity, but instead we have to destabilize them and through coagulation and then through the process of flocculation build flocks. Uh, hopefully those flocks will settle in the settling process, but they're still left over uh, turbidity and that's what we're going to talk about. Um, one announcement that I wanted to share that's completely unrelated to water and wastewater treatment but may be relevant if any of you are thinking about being employed after you graduate is that the uh, Career Expo is next Wednesday um, over in the Student Center from 3 to 6. And um, there's more than 100 companies that are going to be there and quite a lot of them have specifically identified civil engineers as the students that they'd like to talk to. Um, so some of the suggestions that the folks at the Office of Career Education have made is that you should bring your resume to hand out to people and you should think about how you could pitch yourself in a short 30 second period, just what your interests are, maybe the internship that you've done before, your previous employment history, what you're looking for. So. Uh, just the idea of making an impression and having something specific to say. Um, you know, events like this I know can be really uncomfortable when you're going to a crowded hall with it's just kind of pandemonium and chaos because there's so many people there. But then more specifically what can make it uncomfortable is, you know, you're approaching a booth and, uh, you know, they're standing there and so you're having to make the first move. But I just want to reassure you that typically the people that get assigned to events like this are talkative, you know, easygoing people who, you know, they're not going to be naturally skeptical. They're going to be naturally open to, you know, meeting you and hearing about your experience. And so, you know, even if you're more of an introverted type person, which I can sympathize with because I definitely am, um, as long as you just uh, have something to say when you go there like oh so what kind of projects does your company do or where are you located or you know have you been hiring interns lately if you just have some comment or question to kick off the conversation then it can go really naturally from there so don't let you know fear of social engagement affect your career prospects you know take the time and get over there just see what it's all about. So it's from 3 to 6 on Wednesday. Uh, here's a list of some of the civil engineering specific companies and there's more companies that said all majors but these are ones that specifically said that they're interested in civil engineering students and so it's a really lengthy and uh, diverse group of people who are hoping to acquire your engineering talents. So any comments or questions about the Career Expo? All right. Filtration. Um, anybody here ever changed their oil before? I do it. I just noticed that maybe I need to do it again uh, next weekend. The way that oil filters work is by a process that's called straining. And I'm going to talk a little bit about straining just to differentiate it from what's happening in water treatment. Because by and large, the filtration we're talking about today isn't straining. So it's really important to notice the difference between straining and these other um, phenomena that get rid of the leftover colloid particles that didn't settle out in the sedimentation basin. And so with straining, what you've got is some sort of a media that's porous. So um, if it's a fabric filter, it has little holes in the fabric and the oil can go through the holes 
because oil molecules are very small, but little bits of metal would get trapped in the oil filter. And, uh, and it's better to get it stuck in the oil filter than to be circulating around inside the engine causing more abrasion and wear of, of the other parts that are in there. And so the mechanism of removal for straining is just simply that the things you're removing are a larger diameter than the pore size in the media. Um, now, particle straining is just one of several different processes that are sometimes called filtration. Sometimes people refer to adsorption of dissolved chemicals as filtration. Have you ever seen one of these water filters that you can put in the refrigerator? And so the way that they work is typically they have an activated carbon media that you pour water into the top of this pitcher and then it filters downward through and around the activated carbon. And the activated carbon has an affinity for dissolved organic chemicals. And so if you had a little bit of benzene in the source water, or if you had TH, uh, what was THCM was the thing that got spilled in Charleston a few years ago. It was like a coal washing chemical that got spilled into the water and you know the water system was shut down for weeks and weeks in Charleston. Um, activated carbon can draw those dissolved organic materials out of solution and they'll absorb to the carbon. So it's not straining, it's more of a uh, a chemical reaction where something that's dissolved becomes affixed to a stationary particle and then every so often in these activated carbon filters you just have to remove the filter which is usually a plastic cartridge that the crushed up activated carbon is inside. You'd remove it and throw it away. Um, at water treatment plants they sometimes also use activated carbon and typically they'll regenerate it rather than just disposing of it. If you take that activated carbon and then you burn off the, abs the absorbed chemicals, then you can use the activated carbon again. But uh, most people don't have it in their house set up to re-energize re these activated carbon. Just for a small quantity, it's better to just dispose of it. So adsorption is something that sometimes people refer to as filtration. But what we're mostly concerned with today is the process of impaction of particles and then they are adhering to some stationary media. So impaction and adhesion. So this is what we talk about when we are discussing surface water treatment and their use of sand filters. And even groundwater is sometimes run through sand filters, especially if it has dissolved metals that need to be removed like a lot of iron and manganese. Um, or if you're doing softening of water, sometimes if it doesn't all settle out in a sedimentation basin, you could run it through a sand filter. Um, so in the process of particle impaction and adhesion, we have these leftover colloid particles. So these particles have already been through the coagulation process, but just for whatever reason, they didn't get big enough during flocculation to be large enough to settle down to the bottom of the filter. Remember, it's the largest particles that have the largest diameter that have the greatest settling velocity, and they're the ones that are of the highest probability of actually settling in the settling basin. And so this particle is destabilized. And what do I mean by destabilized? You mess up their charge, yeah. So a natural colloid that's just out of the Ohio River has these particles with a net negative charge. But this has had its net negative charge suppressed. And so a lot of you, most of you in fact, on the exam referred to these particles as sticky. And I mean, they're not sticky in the sense that we usually think that like double-sided tape is sticky. I mean, they're not actually sticky, but they are primed to stick to things. So I guess we could say they're sticky. I mean, just if they come into contact with something else, they're probably going to remain in contact with that other thing. It's just that in the flocculation basin, 
the probability wasn't on the side of removing every particle. There were some that made it through. So we've got this small particle. And in fact, this particle is smaller than the sand grains. It's much, much smaller than the sand grains. Just to make it uh, visible on the, um, on the slide, I made this, I don't know, what is that like? Maybe five pixels wide, and the sand grains are 10 pixels wide. But in reality, the sand grain may be a 1,000 times larger than these small destabilized colloids that didn't settle. So they're much smaller. And the reason why I mention that is that there's no way that straining would remove these really small particles. Remember, straining is when the particle to be removed is bigger than the opening in the media. But here, the opening in the media is huge compared to the size of the particle. So it's going to just get through this top layer, no problem. It penetrates down into the filter, and then just by virtue of the path it's taking through the filter, one of these times it's going to come straight into contact with one of the sand grains. You know, maybe before this, it went around the edge of some of them, and uh, it, didn't, it wasn't like a straight-on collision. So since it, it came at an edge angle, it might have gone around. But eventually, it's going to get to one of these sand grains, and it's a straight-on collision where, if you remember back to fluid mechanics, there's this idea of a, a stagnation point. When you have water that's flowing around an obstacle, think about the streamlines. And there's one of these streamlines that's going to stop right at the leading edge of the stationary sand grain. So this was at a stagnation point, and it's stuck to that sand particle. And so now it's removed. Removed from the water that's filtering down. And so not pictured is the fact that you've got just a lot of water flowing through the sand filter from the top to the bottom. And it's in the water that many of these small leftover colloid particles are traveling. So it got stuck. And there's a lot of other ones. Maybe they get stuck early. Maybe they get stuck late. And there could even be a handful of these particles that get all the way through the sand filter if it's not deep enough, or if the particle is particularly small, or maybe if we improperly coagulated the water and it wasn't really that destabilized. There's a variety of explanations. But the goal of this filtration process is through impaction and adhesion to remove particles that otherwise escaped settling out during the uh, sedimentation basin. So water's flowing down, and what I've depicted here is just a single media. This was meant to represent sand, but in most actual applications, they'll have at least two uh, different medias. So you'll maybe have sand as well as a layer of crushed anthracite coal. Um, sometimes they'll have filter medias that have gravel at the bottom and then sand and then on top of that anthracite coal. So there's a variety of different medias that could be used, but uh, the particles are sticking together to the grains and that's the mechanism of removal. So coming out of the clarifier, a pretty typical range of performance of the clarifier would be that you have 1 to 10 uh, NTU which is just a, a measure of how much light gets intercepted uh, in a sample of water. And so it's a representation of clarity and indirectly a representation of how many particles are remaining in the water. And each one of those particles that's left over could have germs inside of it. And so we want it to be really, really low so that when we add disinfecting chemicals later on, that they're not all used up in exposing to these particles that are suspended in the water. So if we can get the uh, turbidity of the water below 0.3, then the disinfection process, which comes later, will be sufficient to ensure that people don't get sick. There are a handful of very old and historic water treatment systems that use a slow loading rate, and it turns out to be effectively straining, but far more common, like more than 99% of the um, sand filters are removing particles by impaction. We'll talk about different loading rate options 
Um, but we can classify different filters by how quickly we load them. And slow sand filters will remove particles by straining, whereas rapid sand filters, which is the, that 99% um, abundance, are removing particles by impaction. And sometimes you can classify different filter types by whether they only use sand or whether they use sand and coal or gravel sand coal. Even a handful of uh, treatment plants may use um, like polymers as part of the filter media. So anthracite coal is used because not only does it have a different density than sand, which is valuable for when we're backwashing, um, but also it has the possibility of removing dissolved organic material in the same way that activated carbon can remove dissolved organics, uh, so can coal. So here's a side view of a sand filter, and you can see that the coal is on the top, and that's not just because that's where they put the coal. We're going to be talking about how occasionally these filters get clogged, and so we have to clean them. And we don't clean it by like shoveling the sand out and then scrubbing it with soap. I mean, obviously, it's got to be a little bit more automated of a process than manual removal. but um, that process of cleaning the clogged filters is accomplished through backwashing. And the nice thing about having coal is that since it is a different density than sand, it's less dense, then it will naturally rise to the top and settle back down on top of the sand grains during backwash. And so you have a stratified layer that um, has advantages related to how the media is supported and how quickly it can shake loose the particles during um, the backwash process. Um, at the bottom of the different multimedia, the sand has or, or sand or gravel has to be supported on some sort of a uh, structure. And historically, a uh, clay, uh, vitrified clay, is is like a uh, high temperature fired material that could have holes inside of it that allows the water to trickle and seep down through. Um, so you can see that it's not just in this photo opportunity that they've got this vitrified clay, but there would be an underlayment inside the sand filter area that all of this material is meant to rest on. And these channels that are built into the vitrified clay or where the water would be collected and is being forced out by the hydrostatic pressure above the sand filter. It's pushing the water through the filter and out through the, uh, the vitrified clay and uh, towards the next step in the treatment process. You can see it has these little drain holes that the, uh, that the water would seep through. Now, you may expect that there's going to be a lot of head loss of water having to go through such a thick layer of very small diameter um, pores. And the way that we ensure that the water flows through, the, through this filter is just by stacking up a certain height or column of water on top of the sand filter. And so the hydrostatic pressure is what forces the water through. I'll have some pictures of the process being used and being um, backwashed in just a moment. So historically, it was this vitrified clay. But of course, it can break or wear down over time. And um, it's very heavy. And less expensive is to use polymers. And they have um, composite underdrain blocks that are perforated and still have the same feature of an open channel that allows the water that's gone through sand filtration to uh, to be collected rapidly, but um, still has pores and, and holes that allow the water to seep down from the media that's being supported above it. OK, so conceptually, I've had these animations before that just illustrate, I think we're going to have a commercial here. <laughs> <laughs> 
So most of the colloid particles were removed during sedimentation, but not all. And so we have water coming in that has a little bit of particles. Now, I don't know why this particular animation is showing them as growing inside of the water that's above the sand filter. I suppose that's possible if we had type 2 settling occurring in the sand filter, but we don't count on any growth of the flock in the sand filter, and so don't make too much of that. We have water, a big column of water, on top of the sand, and then the sand is supported by some sort of an under drain, like whether the block or the plastic. But what you can see is that the flocks are getting trapped in the sand, and eventually you know that it's time to clean the sand when you have to have more and more depth of water to still get the same flow rate through the sand. Because if your sand filter is getting clogged with these par particles, then the head loss is going to increase through the sand filter. Because there are fewer continuous paths for the water to seep through, or the, uh, the paths themselves have a smaller diameter. And so it's just uh, there's more of a pressure drop through the sand filter. That's an indication that the uh, filter needs to be cleaned. Another indication is that they'll have sensors that's measuring the turbidity of the water that's coming out. And so as you see the turbidity begin, begin to rise, that's another indicator that the sand filter needs to be backwashed. So during the backwash process, what we do is we stop the water from coming in. In this uh, earlier process, see this red gate? This red gate is like a plug that's going to cover the inlet pipe as soon as we begin backwash. Okay, so we switch the water, so now the inlet is clogged, and we're using some stored water, and it's going the opposite direction than the water to be treated typically would. So normally the water's going from top to bottom when it's being cleaned, but when the filter is being cleaned, we have the water go from the bottom to the top, and it causes this bed to fluidize. See how the sand portion expanded? It got taller. It's not because there's more sand in there. It's just kind of like, have you ever seen the, kite, the, the skydiving that people can do indoors where there's like a big fan and, and people like will jump into those tubes and they're suspended? It's a similar thing here. You've got a particle that's going to be pushed upward by the fluid that's moving up around it. And so we, it's called bed fluidization, where you've got enough water velocity upward to, um, to cause the particles to not only start moving around, but they're moving around with enough energy that they're kind of, the sand grains are banging into each other. There's some friction there, and it's helping to shake loose the, uh, the clogged particles that we need to get rid of. And so all of this water that comes out is either going to be wasted or it can go through a, a separate settlement, settling basin and then we can try and recycle a portion of it. But the idea is we're using this stored water and the, uh, the particles that were stored inside of the sand are flushed out and when we see that the water's clean, like when you've done enough backwash and the water coming out is clear again, then you can terminate backwash the sand will settle back down, the anthracite coal will settle on top of it, and uh, you start the cycle over again. So once again, we have turbidity coming in, it accumulates in the sand filter, and eventually, when the pressure gets high enough, uh, the pressure drop gets high enough, then we'd know we'd need to clean the filter. So any questions about this process of filtration or backwash? Yeah. Um so you said that you want the coal layer to be on top of the sand layer. Is there a particular reason for that? Yeah. Um, it's because some of the largest, um, like flocks, if they get uh, stuck in the coal, we have more control over the diameter of the uh, coal particles. And so um, by having like a little bit more of a coarse opening, and then we can trap the larger particles first and allow the smaller particles to penetrate. So 
The reason why we want the coal on the top is just simply because, you know, it crushes more easily than we have the ability to change the diameter of the sand grain. So it has a lower density, which means it's going to be on the top. And then um, it gives us a greater penetration depth for the small particles, and the large particles are removed at the top. So that's a good question. So here's kind of a conceptual view of the sand filter. So obviously, you need a big layer of sand. And so here's the filter media, which for our purposes would be some of it sand and some of it coal. And then above that is some headspace. Headspace just means extra distance above the item that's being stored. And part of the time, that headspace will be occupied by water. Um, and the amount of water that's there is going to vary because you may have to have a, a higher depth of water to push the uh, the treat the water that's being treated through when the when the filter is nearing the point that it needs to be backwashed then you're going to have increasing hydraulic head that you need to push the water through and then um, when we're backwashing the leftover water will go through a wash trough and so we'll just add enough flow so that it fluidizes the bed and then the water is entering the wash trough and then exits through something called a gullet. And so that the wash trough and the gullet isn't for the treated water, it's for the waste water that you have during the backwash cycle. The water that is being treated would accumulate down through the under drain blocks. If you go to a water treatment facility, they'll typically have these sand filters enclosed. It wouldn't be usually open to the atmosphere because, you know, this is what we hope is almost finished water and you wouldn't want birds um, going for a swim in this water or flying over it and going to the bathroom. So they're usually enclosed. They may have heaters to help uh, prevent freezing in colder climates, but it looks like just a room full of little swimming pools. Um, but the swimming pools have some things inside. They've got, right now, this, this water is, uh, is being treated. And so there's enough <clears throat> extra water inside the tank right now that it completely um, submerges the troughs or the gullet, which is in the center. Um, this is another view of the system where there's no water in it, so you can see a little bit more clearly. Um, when we're backwashing, they'd add just enough flow so that the water starts to go into these troughs. But if you add too much flow during backwash, then it will put the sand into the, into the troughs. And that's really bad. If you blow out your filter media and lose it, then you're going to have to truck it in again and replace it. And it can, you know, take the filter offline for weeks. And so it's a pretty complex process just to regulate the flow rate and make sure that the bed fluidization doesn't send any of the sand, but only is sending the water. And you can see this is pretty dirty water. You know, you're removing all of that. And this is going to have a much higher turbidity than the water that came in. Because you may have been treating water for five or six hours through the sand filter, and then all of the turbidity that accumulated in the sand over the period of five or six hours is going to be flushed out in maybe 20 minutes. They have and to wash it that often? Yeah, they, they have to wash it pretty regularly. I mean, the cycle varies depending on whether they are softening, uh, the quality of the inlet water, but it's typical for a treatment facility to have maybe six different sets of sand filters so that when one is going through the backwash cycle, the others are still available for filtration. And then they may even have, if they have six different sets, they may have two that are going through backwash at the same time and then, uh, you know, ten that are currently being in, u in use. But so I've only toured probably, you know, maybe a dozen drinking water treatment plants um, and from the ones that I've been to, I think that they were doing backwash cycles as often as five hours and maybe uh, as, as long as 12 or 18 hours. 
but it, it would never be, at least the ones that I visited, never had filters that were being backwashed less often than once a day. Um, so you can see that this water's pretty cloudy just because you're, you're dislodging and eliminating a lot of uh, turbidity all at once. Um, and it comes out of the trough into the gullet down below and towards either a discharge or a water recycle step. And they just keep track of the turbidity of the backwash water and that's how they know when the backwash is complete is when the water starts to become clear then the backwash is almost finished. Um, there can be organic material like from dissolved leaves um, that causes a little bit of foaming during the backwash process. Hopefully not too much foaming because foam can be really difficult to control in both water and wastewater treatment processes. Um, but that's what it's from. And they just keep going until the water becomes more clear. And you can see finally when it's the same clarity as the water that would be coming in, then the backwash cycle is complete. So bed fluidization is what we call the process of countercurrent flow that suspends the sand particles and so that they begin to collide with each other and shake loose the turbidity that had um, impacted and absorbed. Um, I think I've already talked through all of this process, so. Okay, um, one of the ways that we classify sand filters is by how heavily they're loaded, the loading rate. And remember that we had a similar formula that was referring to the settling process where it was a flow rate divided by a surface area. Now this loading rate is a little bit simpler than that other one because here it is the surface area that the water is actually flowing through, the surface area of the sand. Um, so a slow filter removes particles by straining and it requires a lot of space. You'd have to have quite a huge amount of uh, surface area to treat an appreciable amount of water by a slow filtration because you're only putting 2.9 cubic meters per day up to 7.6 cubic meters per day per square meter of surface area. So one pretty well-known slow filter was in Washington DC and I think that the last slow filter that was used in Washington DC was decommissioned in the 1980s but it, it was prominent because they just had to have an enormous area for the water that was being treated. In contrast to a slow filter a rapid sand filter is removing rather by straining it's by that impaction adhesion process and um, a loading rate of about 120 cubic meters per day per square meter is fairly common. And uh, there are some locations where space is at a premium and they want to maximize the flow that they can get through a sand filter and they've taken the loading rates up to uh, as high as 235 cubic meters per day per square meter of surface area. And you could get away with an ultra high loading rate at a place that already had pretty good water quality or if the filter depth was high then you could uh, maybe get away with a high, ultra high loading rate but you know rule of thumb is in the range of about 120 cubic meters per day per square meter of surface area. Now one thing I think is important to mention is that this V sub A is not the velocity that water is traveling through the sand. It's the, the velocity that water is approaching the sand. So let's think about that. Let me see if there's an image that I could use to describe that a little bit better. Uh, differentiating between the velocity through the sand and approaching the sand. Probably, I'll do this one. So think about what if we had a, a bunch of sand in a pipe. It was packed in a pipe. 
and the water is approaching the sand at, let's just say, one meter per second. When the water, a, a one mo molecule of water is going one meter per second, and we've got a certain area of, uh, I didn't even bring a marker. Okay, here's one. Okay, we've got a pipe with a certain diameter, and that diameter gives us a certain area. Area is pi d squared divided by four. Okay, so there's this molecule of water that's going down and then it encounters the sand. So let's say that here's the section of the pipe that has sand in it. The water molecule is going to speed up as it's going through the sand. Does anybody know why the water molecule has to be going faster as it travels through the sand than it was when it was in the uh, just the water portion of the pipe? The space is smaller for the liquid to go through. The space is larger. That's right. It's the, the space that's available is lower. Now remember Q, let's look at this. Uh, this is V1. Oh, this marker is just about dead. Q equals VA, V times A. So the effective flow area is reduced when some of the area is occupied by sand grains. So the, uh, the issue is porosity. So that portion of the column that is sand grains is not available as flow area. And so I just wanted to bring that point up so that you didn't think of this parameter of loading rate as being the velocity of the water as it travels through the media. Because it does have units of meters <coughs> per second, but that meters per second is the speed of the water before it gets to the sand filter, but then when the water's flowing through the sand filter, it's actually going faster than the loading rate because the sand grains are taking up some of the area that water can flow through. I've already talked a bit about redundancy and the need to have um, more than one sand filter so that when you're going through the backwash process, you can still be treating water. Um, if we only had sand, then not all of the filter is going to be utilized. But if we have a dual media filter with different densities and different particle size, then you can strain out or have through impaction the removal of large particles in the first layer and smaller particles in subsequent layers. All right, let's take a look at this in-class exercise just to get some calculation practice related to sand filters. <clears throat> this is one that's mainly intended to give you some practice thinking about the redundancy in a sand filter. So trying to calculate, for example, how many sand filters you'd need if different loading rates are acceptable. All right, we're running low on time. And as much as I'd like to keep you here over on a Friday afternoon, I'm not going to do that. So the surface area, the total surface area you need for this loading rate of 120 is 597.6 square meters. And if each one of them is going to be 7 by 7 meters in surface area, then that means you'd need 12.2 filters overall. Of course, you can't build a fractional filter. They have to be in whole units. And so let's just say, what if we round it down? Because, you know, 120, that's a guideline. It's not a super strict rule. You know, how much would we be pushing things if we use 12 instead of 13? So if we use 12, then the loading rate's just 121.96. And maybe that's OK. But when we begin to think about operationally what's going to happen when 
there is backwash. When we begin to backwash, then that means if we had 12 built, only 11 would be in operation during the backwash phase. And so if we were going to test to see what is the loading rate during backwash, we would be putting the same flow rate across 12, um, 11 filters, which means we're at 133 cubic meters per day per square meter. In other words, that's meters per day, the units there. And so that's too high. You know, the, the example just says, well, if 130 is the limit, then what does that tell us we need to do? So when we look at the backwash phase, that would tell us we probably better build 13 instead of 12, because if we build 13, then we won't exceed this limit of 130 during backwash. Now, the last question was just conceptual. It was asking, uh, what happens if you never backwash? What would happen is the filter would become uh, accumulated with a lot of these small particles, and all of the voids between sand grains would fill up. And you'd have progressively higher and higher head loss until finally uh, even a very tall column of water couldn't force fluid through the filter any longer. It would just be too high. Maybe we wouldn't have built the sand filter with enough hydraulic capacity to force the water through at a certain point. All right, well, I did go over. It's 12.51, so I owe you a minute on Monday, and I'll pay you back with interest. Have a good weekend.